Hey, so just a little info about this collection. Uh, we still get hit with a lot of copyright claims, sadly, and we do fight them, but we have to fight them slowly or else we might get a strike and such. And one of the uh, groups that comes after us a lot is sadly Studio Ghibli in Japan, the Japan version. I don't think the American one comes after us. Uh, so we haven't posted the Disney Sembers of the uh, Studio Ghibli uh, collection, uh, but we're posting it here because we figure if it's one video that gets hit that's a giant collection of them, that we can fight easier than a ton of them. Uh, but what we did that month is that we had uh, Studio Ghibli and then we had like kind of these other Disney films I didn't review that people want me to review. So we're gonna split them up into two. This is the collection of just the Studio Ghibli films and uh, we'll have the other ones that uh, were in this month in another collection. Uh, just to be safe, if this one does get hit, you can still watch the other ones while we fight that. So uh, with that said, take a look and enjoy. If you were to ask a random person on the street who Hayao Miyazaki was, chances are they wouldn't know. But if you were to ask a movie buff, anyone online, or pretty much any person from Japan, everyone would tell you that he is the animation champion of the world. Only in the past 10-15 years has he finally started to get credit in America, allowing our audiences to see tons and tons of his genius work. But it turns out, he's not the only one turning out Miyazaki material. His animation company, Studio Ghibli, has also been turning out timeless classic after timeless classic. Again, only starting to get recognition in America in the past 10-15 years. And who do we have to thank for all this imagination being shown to us? That's right, the Big D. Or more specifically, John Lasseter, who's friends with Hayao Miyazaki and promised to get as much of his work to our audiences as possible. The result was the majority of the studio's films being re-released and re-dubbed in America. But they didn't just half-ass it, they went out of their way to get the best talent possible. The best sound people, the best translators, and of course, the best actors. It only figures that Disney, another great leader in animation imagination, would be the people to introduce us to not only such wonderful artwork, but such fantastic stories. So, this disney December, every single day of the month I am going to be looking at one of the films from Miyazaki or Miyazaki's studio. The one catch is that it has to have been re-released by Disney and redubbed by them, because hey, it is disney December. Now there's only one problem with that. There's not enough films to fill out the entire month. So, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna go back to all the films that people requested but I never got around to. That's right, The Nightmare Before Christmases, The Dick Tracys. Hell, I'll even go over the ones I did a vlog of already, but people seem to want to see the Disney December version of it. And hey, some time has gone by, maybe some of the opinions have changed. So, every other day it's a Studio Ghibli film, and the other half of the days it's gonna be one of the Disney classics. But hell, even that's not enough! So, I'm gonna give in to peer pressure and also do a vlog series on one that I've been getting a lot of requests to do for a while. That's right, both my brother and I are gonna be doing a vlog series of Gravity Falls, right along with Disney December every single day of the month. It'll be the most ambitious Disney December yet. You'll be vomiting rainbows a week after watching them. There's a lot of imagination, a lot of great characters, a lot of great stories. Hell, there's just a lot of greatness to get through. So sit back, everybody. This is Disney December, the Studio Ghibli Overlook Classics and Gravity Falls edition. Let's start with a film that wasn't technically Studio Ghibli when it came out, but they still marketed it under the name and Disney picked it up anyway, so I think it counts. Nausicaa and the Valley of the Wind, a film surely not to be ignored. This was only director Miyazaki's second film and already it was a gigantic epic. The story centers around a princess. Yeah, get used to seeing those. I think Ghibli might be the only studio that actually uses princesses more than Disney. Who lives in an apocalyptic future. Actually, one of the nicer apocalyptic futures. Very green, lots of mountains, nice scenery. Well, at least in this part of the world. Other parts of the world, there's nothing but war a brewing. Everyone's attacking everyone, trying to find old monsters and creatures to destroy one another. When those warring countries find the Valley of the Wind, they see an opportunity to use their land and their resources to their advantage. Nausicaa, after discovering the death of her father, peacefully tries to find a way to save everybody and not cause any more bloodshed. Along the way, he comes across a boy who's on the other side and asks her to join his quest. But she doesn't want to be on anyone's side, she just wants war to leave and no more people to die. No more people or bugs. Yes, in this futuristic world, there's also giant monsters that look like bugs. Hell, even the planes kind of look like bugs. Which is kind of cool when you think about it. You assume all birds are gone in this world, so their planes wouldn't really look like birds like ours. Instead, they will look like insects. Kind of a neat note. But nevertheless, Nausicaa doesn't want anything living to perish. 
So she goes back and forth between every single side imaginable trying to find the peaceful route. For only a second film, it's one hell of an ambitious project. It tries to throw so much at you, and for the most part, it pays off pretty well. You very easily understand the conflict of every single character. And every single character does have a conflict. It's a lot of fun just seeing them work off each other, trying to figure out strategies, what to do next. Everything is always in a huge rush. Something like that can usually be a little too busy and distracting, but the characters are strong enough to pull it through. At first I thought it was kind of weird that Nausicaa would flip-flop back and forth between sort of this crying, sad, emotional person to this sudden, sword-wheeling badass that always seems to have a plan. But when you see what it's all building up to in the end, yeah, actually it does kind of make sense. It's kind of like a peaceful person who knows how to fight but never really wants to fight because she doesn't want to see anyone hurt. So when she does have to do it, or her rage gets the best of her, she feels an incredible amount of guilt. With that said, I love the fact that she always has a plan. I mean, always. Our ship is going down? You go this way, I'll go that way, I'll jump up here and do this thing. Kingdom being overthrown? I'll go this way, you go this way. We'll rendezvous after we do the huge, big, gigantic thing. She isn't just kicking a little bit of ass and that's it. She always has a strategy, and she comes up with them so fast. She's a lot of fun to watch. She also has a real good supporting cast. Voice actors like Patrick Stewart and Shia LaBeouf really add a lot of credibility. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. Shia LaBeouf at credibility? Well, yeah, say what you will about his personal life in the Transformer movies, but I don't think he's that bad an actor. And I think he finds just the right mix in this role. Angry and vengeful, but still looking for the right thing to do. If I did have a problem with this film, though, I would actually say that, as good as the characters are, I could have used just a little bit more of them. That is to say, if a story like this really wanted to have the biggest impact, it probably should have been too. I mean it when I say they throw a lot at you, and it is constantly on the move. That's not to say they don't have their slower moments to just be characters. They do, and they're done well. But for the giant climax this film is trying to build up at the end, I felt I really want to know these people a touch more. For example, the villain, played by Uma Thurman, and her second-in-command seem to have this kind of playful banter where they almost hope the other would die, but they also kind of respect the strategy of the other. A part of me really wanted to know more about that. But it's a big animated epic and you can only fit into two hours, so a lot of that stuff has to be cut. And I'm sure there was more stuff. This is based on a manga. I get the feeling they went into even more detail about these people. It's not that the film needs to be longer, it already feels like a decent length. I just felt like I really wanted to be on these characters' side more than what I was. Which is to say, I didn't want to see them perish, but I didn't feel the entire weight of the film the way I think it wanted me to feel it. Maybe one or two less scenes of traveling and shouting orders replaced with a little bit more of natural talking would have done it. But that really is a bit of a nitpick. It's still very large in scale and very impressive to look at. And I want to know what it's all going to amount to. Had they been able to explore a little bit more, I think this could have been on par with, say, the Lord of the Rings movies. But as is, it's still pretty damn impressive. It's so cool seeing where all of these Miyazaki tropes start. The technology, the monsters, the love of nature. His thumbprint is all over it. And it's even more impressive when you think no computers were used on it either. I mean, look at this. This looks like something that could be animated today. Great backgrounds, great environment, great atmosphere, great characters, great story. What else can you say? Nausicaa in the Valley of the Wind is just great. Go take a rent and see for yourself. The awesomeness of Castle in the Sky can be summed up right in the very opening. Ships are soaring through the air, a young girl falls out, a boy discovers her, and suddenly a glowing crystal causes her to slowly but surely float down to the ground while enchanting music is played. Yep, that's the movie in a nutshell. And I mean that in a very positive way. Castle in the Sky has all the ambitious adventure of a kid's film that you remember watching in the 80s. The ones that had a touch of an edge, but mostly a very timeless, endearing feel to them. The ones like Return to Oz or Labyrinth. The ones that still seem to hold up after so many years. Well, for the most part. There's no David Bowie cod piece in this. Though maybe the head of that robot could... Anyway, the film starts off exactly like I said. A girl falling to the ground and a boy discovers her. 
The boy's name is Pazu and the girl's name is Sheeta, voiced by Anna Paquin and James Vanderbeek. He nurses her back to health as she admits that she's being chased by some evildoers. The kind that know that she is the key to some sort of mystical something or other. Again, very 80s fantasy. Quite coincidentally, Pazu has been looking for that something or other. A floating city known as Lapuda. Some believe it's been destroyed, others say it never existed, but of course, our young heroes are destined to discover it. Along the way, they come across some treacherous air pirates, with their leader voiced by Cloris Leachman, who in my opinion can do no wrong. She once again plays up both the comedy and the awesomeness of this character, being both goofy and badass at the same time. The villains chasing them are led by Mark Hamill, who, if you know his voice over work, once again gives a deviously delicious performance, dragging out his lines and constantly making you question does he have a British accent or not. Once again, not only does the artwork in this movie show a lot of patience and a lot of passion, but the creativity is just wonderful. I feel like I'm watching an extended version of the timeless Disney afternoon shows, kind of like DuckTales meets Tailspin, Duck Tales Spin with people. But whatever you call it, it's a ton of fun. The dubbing is once again very well done, with the main characters' voices displaying the wide-eyed whimsy, and the side characters being goofy and memorable. For whatever reason, I especially like the lighting in this film too, particularly the day versus night. I'm always a sucker for night shots that have that warm glow from a building, and something about Miyazaki's skies are always just so blue, you can get lost in them somehow. I don't know what color he's choosing or what palette he has, but they're always just incredible. You want to fly through these skies every time you see them. If I had to nitpick anything wrong, I guess I could say that maybe James Vanderbeek sounds a touch too old to be playing this part, but then again, you can't quite figure out the boy's age, maybe just his voice is changing. Everything else in this movie is classic Miyazaki. A lot of focus on the technicals and how they work. A lot of using machinery, but also this very high respect for plant life. There's something so cool about seeing those rustic robots and yet having green grow on them. In a strange way, I think that almost sums up Miyazaki's work. A perfect combination of advanced technology that's also kind of old, kind of new, but always has a good mix of nature in there too. The pirates especially are just so likable. I don't know what it is about them, they're just so much energy and they're so goofy and they have such an awesome leader. It's pretty hard not to wish you could be a part of this group. It has a lot of the pretty imagery, a lot of the nice colors, and a lot of the imagination that you usually associate with his work. It's hard to know what else to say about it. I mean, I don't know if it's going to be breaking any big barriers necessarily, at least none that I know of, but as these general fantasies go, ones that mix technology with great characters, and a gripping story with lots of nature, and excitement, and romance, and just all that good stuff that you've grown to love, this one mixes them up pretty good. Take flight and discover for yourself. Whenever there's a discussion about the most powerful animated films, like no fairy tales, no magic, just pure, raw, adult emotion, Grave of the Fireflies is usually brought up. A lot of people consider it a good segue who see animation as just kid stuff, something that can't be taken seriously by adults. So when I heard that, I got really excited and I sort of got this idea of what it was going to be like and what it was going to be about. I saw this film around the same time I saw Saving Private Ryan on the big screen, and I had an idea what it was going to be. Oh, war is bad, people throwing up their hands saying why, oh, the no good of violence, and so on and so forth. But what I got was something very, very different. I knew it was going to be more focused on the family end, but not quite in the way they depicted it. I don't even see it as really a war movie. I see it more as a battle between pride and sanity between love and self-preservation. So it kind of confused me when I was younger because I kept thinking I was going to see some sort of anti-war film and I felt that's not really what I got. I didn't dislike it, I knew it was good, I just didn't quite know what to clarify it as, what to accept it as. Now that I'm older, that's one of the things I like the most about it. It doesn't seem anti-war or pro-war, it's just a boy and his sister trying to figure out what's the most important. You know the film's gonna be grim when you see the death of our main character being reunited with the spirit of his younger sister. Well, we know this doesn't end happily, we can only go up from here. The two have a flashback as they roam the spirit world of how they got to where they are. The boy's name is Sieta, and the girl is Sesuko. 
They're in the final days of World War II, but you wouldn't know it with all the bombings that are still going on. Their father is in the war, and their mother is suddenly killed from one of the bombings. The two decide to go live with a distant aunt, but she starts to get a little on their nerves, claiming they aren't working hard enough for the food that she's preparing, and having a pretty understandable breakdown every once in a while for the situation that she's been put in. Unsatisfied with the living situation, Sieta decides to take his sister and live on their own, believing he's totally capable of doing so. Trying to claim his independence, slowly but surely he discovers that they can't survive on their own. But he's too proud and too determined to see the truth and lives in a horrible state of denial, thinking that if he tries harder and sticks to his independence, they can come out of this okay. But reality starts to set in and options start to become fewer and fewer. Always thinking salvation is just a day away, he continues to try his best living on his own while his world crumbles. The artistic style in this movie is not trying to be so much pretty or showing off as much as trying to be more realistic. They still move like anime characters, but it's not trying to do any big kicks or flips or any weird angles. Most of the shots keep very still and just let the emotion of the animation carry it through. As well as the voice acting, which is dubbed over pretty well. I personally grew up with a subtitle version and prefer that one a bit more, but the dub is still very well done. There's a lot of different ways you can look at this movie. On the one hand, you can see the boy as a terrible character. Not only is he laying himself starved to death, but he's laying his sister starved to death as well. But I think because they choose to do this age, it makes us suddenly understand what he's trying to accomplish. I think a lot of growing people at that age can become incredibly delusional. And that may be part of the focus of the story, is not to try and grow up too fast, and to appreciate what you have and who you have while you still have them. While many people see it as an anti-war film, and I suppose you can see it as that way, my thought is that this can take place over any disaster. It could happen after a tornado, a tsunami, an earthquake, or yes, even a war. The focus is on the boy who doesn't realize how far he's being pushed, and that there's no crime in accepting failure or asking for help. Part of what makes it work is that the boy himself is not a mean character. A lot of people that have a lot of pride, they usually just throw into the jerk category. Oh, there's nothing good about them, they're just too full of themselves and think they can do stuff that's totally delusional. But this kid's a likable kid. His dad is a fighter and he wants to do the same thing, he wants to be the big supporter. A lot of young people were under that delusion during World War II. If you're failing, it just means you're not trying hard enough. Fight harder, fight harder. I think there's this sense of losing one's honor if you accept defeat. Which is fitting as we see Sieta witness the surrender of Japan. And he's furious by it. He doesn't care that the war is over, he's just torn apart that they actually lost. It's a film that takes an angle that many films like this don't take. Not the family element, there's a lot of movies that do that. But the coming of age element of knowing when to declare your independence and when not to. And that the consequences can be greater than you ever could have imagined. For someone who was expecting more of the Saving Private Ryan route where there was going to be a lot of dead bodies and a lot of gore and a lot of obvious symbolism, I was really blown away that the emotionally gripping and tormenting parts of this movie are the simple choices that they make, and how easily things could have been fixed if he just swallowed his pride. As a young man watching this, I don't know if I was really ready to accept that. Or at least, I didn't know how to accept it. Maybe in that way it was more ahead of its time an adult than I thought. You have to have a real understanding of what misguided pride can do, and what the non-acceptance of failure can be capable of. The honorable route is not always the winning route. And that's a tough thing not just for people growing up to learn, but for straight up grown-ups to learn. It gets a little better and a little more heartbreaking every single time I see it. And maybe that's because I feel like I understand it a bit more every time I see it. But again, one of the great things is, you could look at it a totally different way. Maybe it's about respecting your elders, maybe there is no right or wrong. Maybe it's all about the war, maybe it's all about the consequences of war. Anyone can look at and draw their own conclusion. What is concrete about the film is that you look at these two characters and want them to make it through. Even though you're told at the very beginning that they're not going to make it through. This makes it all the more heartbreaking as you watch. Whatever age you are, it's an important film to check out. It's unlike any other film of its kind, and deserves all the praise that it gets. It's the iconic My Neighbor Totoro, a character so famous that he's actually the icon for Studio Ghibli. A big hit in Japan and even growing a cult following in America, the hype and good talk around this movie is so big that a lot of people actually end up kind of not liking it. 
And I can see why. It's built up so much and this image is so popular that anyone going in thinking they're gonna see this spectacular big story is probably gonna be really disappointed. Luckily, when I went in, I had no expectations whatsoever. I just got it from a friend saying, hey, this is a good movie, check it out. I did, and that's pretty much what I thought too. It was a good movie. Not great, but I don't think it's supposed to be great. I think it's supposed to be just a fun little flick. Why there's such an explosion over it, I don't know. Maybe people just like the sort of smaller flicks and want to get it more attention to a point where it's actually exploded into this giant franchise, kind of like how A Christmas Story has. But for what it is, I like it fine. The story's about a family that moves into a new home. There's a father, a mother, and two little daughters, played by the Fanning sisters. But they discover something very interesting about this home. Apparently there's spirits all over the place. In any other movie, this would probably be a scary thing, but the family just kind of accepts it and says hi. Sometimes the spirits say hi back, but most of the time they just keep in hiding. And wouldn't you know it, one of them is a giant... koala cat thing known as Totoro. He doesn't exactly do much, he just kind of sleeps, takes the bus, he can fly, that's kind of cool. And he has absolutely no dialogue outside of one or two roars. And that's about it. Really, that's the movie. It's just sort of watching these girls interact with the spirit and them getting used to moving to a new location. And for whatever reason, it kind of works. And don't get me wrong, there's still some incredible imagery in this. The backgrounds are wonderful. There's this cat bus thing that's now become world famous. And a lot of the flying scenes are very nice. But if you were to ask me what happens scene by scene, like in order of the story, I couldn't tell you. That is to say, stuff does happen. You see them trying to get used to being in this place and interacting with boys and so on and so forth, but the story's not really the focus. The focus is more character and atmosphere. The casting of the Fanning sisters was a very clever call, as they work very naturally off each other. They don't act like co-actors or even just friends, they feel like sisters. Something about that camaraderie and the way they work off each other, it's pretty solid. The rest of the voice acting is pretty good too. Though not a ton is required of it, it's still pretty effective. It's kind of like spending a really laid back Sunday outside with some friends, maybe coming across a weird animal or trying to interact with it, playing around, getting dirty, coming home, and going to sleep. That's kind of the movie. But again, that's kind of childhood too, isn't it? Kind of those fun summer days where you could just sort of do whatever you want, you're out of school, and I don't know, that's how I see this movie. It's just kind of a really fun yet laid back summer when you're a little kid. There's fun music and goofiness, but there's also a lot of quiet moments of just a character looking at another character or just taking the other in. And there's something actually really charming about it. I don't know, maybe that's kind of the strange fascination with the film, that absolutely nothing can happen on screen, and yet you're still kind of sucked into it. There's a whole scene where one of the sisters just sits on top of Totoro, and that's it. There's another scene where the other sister just waits for a bus with Totoro, and that's it. Yet something about the way it's paced and animated and delivered, it feels very alive somehow. You don't feel like you're being manipulated or that this is lazy. You look like you're watching something kind of cool. Not spectacular, but kind of cool. And the film allows you to take in that small bit of wonder. While it's not big, it still allows you to take in the full amount. You soak in the scene. You remember the feelings. You remember the expressions. If stuff like that doesn't do it for you and you're looking for something that's a lot more story-based, then you're probably not going to have a good time with this. Granted, there is a dilemma in the last third of the film, but it almost feels a little forced and in some ways not needed. Like, the film just needed some kind of climax. But it's nowhere near so contrived that it ruins anything. You still want to see everything turn out okay and stick with these characters. But yeah, don't expect a lot of action or a lot of wonder or a lot of story, but just expect a small amount to be satisfied. I think that's part of the charm of Miyazaki's films. You have this art form of animation, anything you can draw can suddenly exist, and yet they use it to tell the story of only a few fantastical things and focus more on the human characters. Something about keeping it so minimal actually makes you appreciate what's on screen even more. At least from my point of view. 
I don't know. I haven't heard there's like any kind of backlash for this film, but I've definitely heard of people that watched it and just didn't get what it was all about. And I can understand that. There is so much buildup for this movie. The image is shown all over the place. Hell, it's even in Toy Story. If you're looking for more of a relaxed film that you can pop in and just sort of enjoy the atmosphere of, you'll find it to be pretty charming, pretty creative, and just the right amount of entertaining. I personally don't see it as one of my favorites. I don't even know if I put it in one of Miyazaki's top five, but it's still good, and there's a lot of effort that's put into it. It's small, it's simple, but who says there's anything wrong with that? Everybody's gonna have a film that just connects with them for some reason they can't entirely explain. For many, that movie was My Neighbor Totoro. For me, it's Kiki's Delivery Service. In a sense, they're very similar. Not a lot of story, not a lot of action, just sort of a laid-back setup with a touch of the supernatural. But for some reason, this really grabbed me and hooked me a lot more than My Neighbor Totoro did. And that's especially impressive when you're given the age that I saw it. I was a junior in high school when I first saw this, and I didn't want to see any of this prissy stuff. What, a little witch with a big bow flying around, not casting spells, but instead delivering bread to people? Ah, oh, come on. Give her a machine gun or something. I'm a stupid high schooler. That's what I want to see. But even with that prejudice going in, I saw this on TV and surprisingly kept watching it. Even for as cutesy and simple as it was, something about it just really drew me into it. To a point where at the end, I found myself really loving it. The story centers around Kiki, of course, played by Kirsten Dunst. She's excited because she's at the age where witches can set off on their own and try to find their own identity. They leave the family, find a place to live, and try to see if they can work in the real world. She flies to a town far away where she eventually gets a job as a delivery girl. Accompanied by her snarky cat, voiced by Bill Hartman, the movie just follows her around as she does sort of typical girly things. Make deliveries, chat it up with friends, talk about boys, all that good stuff. And once again, that's kind of all there is to it, just watching the simple life of this little witch. I really love how Miyazaki's worlds are just so accepting of these fantastic supernatural elements. They just live in a world where witches are normal. Okay, whatever, there's a witch flying around. Hi, how you doing? But at the same time, they still ask her questions and want to know things about her. It gives a very clear understanding of how they're accepted in this world. Kirsten Dunst is absolutely perfect as Kiki. It never feels forced. It never feels like she's playing the role too young or too old. It seems like the perfect age. All the side actors are great, too. The only one I might have an issue with is Phil Hartman as the cat. I don't know, it's not bad, but there's always something about his cynical sense of humor where you're not sure if he's really taking the role seriously or not. A lot of people can find that even funnier, but I don't know, sometimes it seems a touch off-putting to me. But then again, that's also kind of the character, so I'm up in the air about it, but it doesn't distract too much for me. I can see how people would enjoy him. Your room is nice, but let's take your mother's. You're no help. If I did have a problem, it's once again kind of like My Neighbor Totoro, there's kind of a forced climax at the end. This one's even bigger than My Neighbor Totoro because it's like this great big action scene. And on the one hand, yeah, you have a character that can fly around. It kind of makes sense to do something a little action oriented, but it just kind of comes out of the blue. It's kind of different from the rest of the feel of the movie, and I don't know, it's not bad, I guess. I just sort of feel like, couldn't you cut that out and leave sort of the very low-key tone alone? But then again, doesn't every movie kind of need an ending and a third act to build some conflict and drama? I don't know, there must have been some other way to do this. It's not terrible, it's just a touch unfitting. But the rest of the film, like I said, is just enjoying the very simple but likable life of this little girl. You get to know the town, you get to know the neighbors and the side characters, and of course, she gets to fly around. And the flying shots are wonderful. I don't know what it is, but something about the way Japanese animation does flying scenes, they're very well done. There's not even a CG used here, and yet somehow you really feel like she's in the air. Something about the angles and the movement they get, I'm not sure what the magic formula is, but they got it nailed. Somehow they animate it so that you feel the weight of the character that's actually flying, and I don't know how you do that, but they found a way. 
Look at how she drops here. You feel the gravity in that scene. Like I said, I'm not entirely sure why I like this one more than my neighbor Totoro, but something about it really did grab me. Maybe it's because she does explore a little bit more and she does have to travel, but at the same time you get an idea about how this world works and how people accept witches, and yeah, you almost kinda wanna live in this world. It seems so simple and relaxed that you really enjoy being there. You kinda wanna sit with this artist and talk about what she's painting. You kinda wanna help this old lady bake something for her granddaughter's birthday. And you really get bummed out when the daughter actually doesn't like the thing that she bakes, and you're just like, come on, you spoiled little brat, what's wrong with you? She worked really hard for that, you ungrateful little bitch! <sighs> you see what I mean? Somehow I get really wrapped up in these tiny little problems that's going on in this town and with this one girl, but screw it, I'm with her. It's like just sitting through a little bit of real life and yet somehow with this supernatural character. It's such a weird combo, but for whatever reason, it really works. I can't even think of any other words to describe it except delightful. It's just friggin' delightful. I love being with these people, I love being in this town, I love flying around it, and I like seeing it from the point of view of this wide-eyed, adventurous innocent. She's just friggin' adorable. I love it when she gets a package delivered. I love it when she gives that one chef a hug for making that little delivery sign out of bread. I love it when she laughs when they almost got killed riding that weird fan bike thing with that weird inventor boy and just, I can't help it. It's just irresistible. So like I said, if you're not a fan of these kind of stories that, well, don't have much of a story and mostly just atmosphere and character, you probably won't get that sucked in. But me, I enjoyed every minute of it. I love that they feel they didn't have to stick to the formula of a three-act structure, that they could just show a little bit of life being lived. Sometimes just experiencing what somebody is going through is more exciting than being told what they're going through. You get more sucked into a world when it feels more real, and reality doesn't always have these three-act structures or these clever lines. Sometimes it's just a little bit of life playing its way. Films like Bambi, Winnie the Pooh, Christmas Story, The Sandlot, they all knew that. And I think Kiki does too. For me, it was the perfect little adventure that made my appreciation of Miyazaki a lot bigger. Sometimes a movie needs a pig. That is the only reason I can think that they actually put a pig as the main star of Porco Rosso. A charming little film about a rogue World War I veteran pilot who gets into trouble, flies around, fights off debts as well as air pirates, comes across all sorts of cool characters, and is also a pig. And truth be told, there is pretty much no reason for him to be a pig. I mean, don't get me wrong, I know it's symbolic, it's a curse, it's something that he has to overcome, but really, if you wrote that out, it would make little to no difference. It's not like my neighbor Totoro or Kiki where they can do all sorts of cool, big, supernatural things, it's just, he's a guy who happens to be a pig. I just don't get the point of it. The film is about a pilot under the same name, who's trying to make a living but is constantly chased down by people he owes money to. He's constantly relaxing at a hotel run by a friend named Gina, and is constantly being bugged by an egotist named Curtis. Along his travels, he gets shot down and needs his plane repaired by his old mechanic friend. But he's not doing much work anymore, so he hands it off to his daughter named Theo. Skeptical of her ability, she proves herself to be not only good, but downright brilliant at what she does. Soon Porco starts to realize she has the same diabolical brain that he does, and start working well off each other and start planning ways to continue their mischievous adventures. But once Curtis challenges him to one final duel, they make a deal. If Porco wins, Curtis will agree to pay off all of his debts. But if he loses, Theo throws herself in as the prize and agrees to marry him. Will Porco's confidence get him through? Or will the demons of the past distract him from the bigger goal? In many respects, it's much more like the calmer Miyazaki projects. I mean, true, there is a lot of flying around and gunfire and stuff, but it's not for, say, a war or something on a grand scale like Nausicaa. It's more along the lines of tailspin, that kind of stuff. Yeah, there's violence, but it's all kind of playful. The characters, once again, are all really funny and really memorable. The dubbing is very well done, with Michael Keaton as the lead. Although not as sexy as that American flyboy. Anyway, I'm off to Milan to fix my plane. You're in Italy? Sorry, baby. Gotta fly. You jerk! But, once again, I just don't get why this character's a pig. In the story, he's cursed because he fled away like a coward. 
and it's sort of a debate at the end whether or not the curse is actually lifted, which I like that. But I j why a pig? Couldn't you do something a lot more imaginative with this? Couldn't he be like a monster with five arms and that way you can animate them in a fun way? Couldn't you make him like a giant fly so he can fly around already? Or couldn't you just, I don't know, what can you do with a pig? Even the people around him don't seem to care. They're just like, oh yeah, we know him. He's a pig, whatever. And like I said, in most Miyazaki projects, that's part of the charm, but here it just doesn't seem to affect anything. You could just as easily have him be a normal pilot with just a scar on his hand or something, like in Princess Mononoke. The only thing I can figure is maybe they just wanted a little bit more of an identity for the film, like a visual identity. Like, you can look at the poster and be like, a pig flying? What? I'll believe that when pigs fly- oh wait, yeah, I guess that's the joke. But it just kind of seems like a middle that doesn't have a whole bunch of possibilities. Either make him something really grand or crazy, or have what he's cursed with just something very subtle. But like I said before, that by no means makes it a bad movie. For all the dog fights and machine gun fire in this, it's actually very, very relaxed. It's just the characters being really charming and working off each other, having pleasant conversations. The writing's decent, the acting's decent, it's all good. I just don't get the main creative choice. But maybe I don't need to, because the film is still a lot of fun regardless. I don't think I like it quite as much as Kiki because, like I said, they do take more advantage of the idea, but still enjoyable and worth seeing at least once. Hell, the animation is so good, maybe it's even worth seeing twice. If you want a film that has a little bit of excitement, a lot of humor, but still at its heart, it's just kind of laid back, this is definitely a good one to check out. By popular demand, Pom Poco. I wish I had a better excuse as to why I didn't include this in the original Disney Ember, but honestly, I just forgot. I thought I had schedule, but then when I looked over the list, it looked like it wasn't on there, so I said, okay, we'll get to it now. The film itself is anything but forgettable with a very distinct and entertaining story. Pom Poco is about a bunch of raccoons, or tanukis, who are constantly fighting for their land that is trying to be taken over by the humans. However, the angle on this isn't quite as dramatic as, say, Princess Mononoke. It's actually got a lot more comedy and is more upbeat. Uh, for the most part. When you think about a bunch of raccoons trying to attack humans, you don't really think of that much variety. But again, remember, this is Japanese lore, and the tanukis could shapeshift. Yeah, remember in Mario 3 how he could always turn into a statue in the tanuki suit? Well, this is the same idea. The raccoons can not only turn into people, but they can also bend and shape their body however they want. The only problem is, a lot of them have forgotten how. And with the land constantly being destroyed more and more every day, they send out to the elders to show them how to do it once more. The elders of course teach them well, and it's a constant battle back and forth to see who can keep the land and who's going to lose it. Being much more comedic, these characters end up being very likable and very funny. It's almost like watching a Looney Tunes cartoon, just seeing these big-eyed fluffy animals constantly go against people and allow them screaming and yelling and running around flailing their arms and making jokes back and forth. It always keeps the energy really high. But at the same time, it has a lot of character too. You do get to know these raccoons and their personalities and you like how they work off each other and how celebratory they are and how they always get along for the most part and they're always going on adventures and you don't want to see them lose their land. The voice acting doesn't have as many celebrities as much as natural voiceover artists like Tress McNeil, Marisa Marsh, but they do fit in a few names like Jonathan Taylor Thomas and J.K. Simmons, and they all do fine for what's required. The only thing I might have a little bit of an issue with is that there's a surprisingly kind of high death toll in this movie. Yeah, it doesn't look like it, and in some ways the tone doesn't even act like it, but a lot of characters die in this. Both people and raccoons. Some have a heavy impact, but others are just kind of a glance in a sentence. On the one hand, I say this kind of gets in the way with the light-handed tone, but then on the other hand, we don't really question that much when we see stormtroopers falling to their deaths constantly. And hey, maybe a little bit of dark reality can help too. It doesn't totally ruin the tone, just once in a while it's a touch distracting. And oh yeah, let's talk about this elephant in the room. For anyone that has seen the original Japanese version, there's a scene that you might find a little, um, awkward. When they're finding out what their bodies can do and what they can make shapeshift, they find out something very bizarrely unique. They can blow up their genitalia to an incredible size. 
Yep, those big things that they're bouncing off of, that's supposed to be their private parts. Um, different cultures, I guess. Again, on the one hand, I can see a bunch of kids laughing at this. Oh, isn't that funny? They're using their private parts and making the big tee hee ha ha. But on the other hand, Jesus Christ, they're using their private parts. Now, to be fair, they don't really look that much like their private parts, seeing how they're playing with the size and shape and everything. But this is still kind of fucked up. I remember when I saw this in Japanese, I said, well, there went the chances for an English dub there. But nevertheless, Disney still picked it up. So I remember thinking to myself, how the hell are they gonna tap dance that little bit? Well, apparently in this version now, Tanukis have pouches. Yep, that's their way around it. And in all fairness, I don't think it's actually that bad a way around it. I mean, come on, even taking the Disney equation out of it, wouldn't you be a little uncomfortable if American audiences saw raccoons using their junk to fight people? Different cultures, I understand, but as someone who grew up in this culture? Yeah, that would never get a market and instead would be replaced with a ton of angry parents. So I actually think it was a very clever solution. But whether they keep that in or they don't, it's still a very highly entertaining movie. Most of it is just watching them trying to stop the humans from taking over the land and trying to show the value of what they have. Very simple, but very effective and very funny. Sometimes it gets a touch heavy handed, like the main character actually looks at the camera at the end and speaks to the audience saying the very obvious message. But for the most part, it's just a really enjoyable adventure with a ton of creativity and a lot of imagination. It's also nice to see Studio Ghibli do kind of a different story, something that doesn't take place in a fantasy world but has fantasy characters. And they're not human, they're all animals. I don't really see that from Ghibli too much where all the main characters are animals. It's got good characters with a good plot and a good moral. It's definitely a lot of fun to check out. Transform into something that's fast and check it out for yourself. Whispers of the Heart doesn't get a lot of attention, but it probably should because for what it is, it does it very well. A coming-of-age story about a girl learning about life and romance and growing up and parents and family and friends, all that stuff. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. Haven't we seen this a million other times in a million other movies made for teenagers and tweens and they're always done awful and they're always super sappy and cliched? Well, while there are a few corny moments here or there, I think this is actually a very well done film that really addresses the age. I think it very much shows the battle going on with a lot of young people between their passion and what they should most likely do with their lives. Our main character is named Shesuku. She's a bookworm who loves to write and discovers one day that all her favorite books are checked out by another person. She starts to daydream about who this person is, but then realizes it's a boy she can't stand. Over time, of course, they both start to lower their defenses and they realize they actually really like each other. But that's only one part of the story. Another part involves her discovering this antique shop where all sorts of statues and beautiful items give her ideas for stories. She befriends the owner and starts to find there's a real magic to the place, at least in a way that inspires her imagination. So much so that she's now determined to become a full-time writer, even at her young age. She tells her parents she wants to drop out of school and spend all her time trying to write her perfect story. The parents, respectful that she wants to choose her own path, perhaps even a little too respectful, allow her to leave for a bit so she can do exactly that. Yeah, some would argue not the best choice, but then again, she does obviously learn her lesson, and I don't know, it's a little controversial, but it's an interesting talking point. And once again, that's kind of the very simple story. We're just following her around, seeing what her life is like, as she herself is trying to figure out what her life is like. Where is she going? What does she want to do? What's her destiny? What's her calling? All that fun stuff that teenagers ask themselves a million times when they're younger. The film has a lot of charm and even a lot of drama, but as before, there's not a ton of story. So again, if this is something that doesn't grab you, you can probably pick it up very quick. But I personally saw it as one of those annoying teen romp stories that were constantly advertised in America in the early 2000s and hell, even nowadays, I'm sure. That's actually done right and done with respect to its main characters and just young people in general. You kind of get sucked into her stories. You really enjoy her relationship with the man who owns the shop. You kind of hope in a strange way maybe her and the boyfriend can get together even though they may not be perfect or maybe they are perfect. I don't know. It's young love and that's the point of it. 
Even the corny scenes, I mean like the really corny scenes are still so damn likable. There's a scene where they're trying to learn this American song, and they're trying to learn it in English, which yeah, is a little weird with an American dub, but I think you can still catch on to what they're doing. And as they're trying to sing the song, all of a sudden all these guys are just getting back from a concert and they hear her singing, so what do they do? They all go down and they start playing with her! Oh my god, this is so silly and hokey, but I can't help it, it's just so likable! Maybe it's because the rest of the atmosphere of the film is just so down to earth and so mellow, so that when something like this happens that is pretty cheesy, you kind of accept it because it doesn't happen that much in this film. A kind of corny moment can play okay as long as the rest of it is mostly grounded in reality. It doesn't go for too many obvious laughs or too many traditionally dramatic moments. It instead tries to capture that age when possibility starts to meet the real world. When dreams can be dashed, but when you discover that just means new ones can open up. The voice acting once again is very nicely done. I heard the girls that were best friends in this were actually best friends in real life, so they worked off each other much more naturally. They even got Carrie Elways for this one throwaway role that actually plays a bigger part in a later movie, but we'll get to that when we get to that. It's actually clever that they brought him in for just a few lines, but again, I can't say too much until we get to the later film. If I do have one problem with the film is that the ending is really sporadic, out of nowhere, and really fast. I mean, there's like no lead into the credits. It's like somebody says a line and then suddenly we're against these pretty buildings with a nice song playing with the credits rolling. There's no segue, there's no fade to black, there's no nothing, it just jumps straight to it. And yeah, I kinda get the idea with the final line, it's puppy love, it's that age, it's all about falling in love at this certain point in time, and how you are, and you rush into things, it's still weird. But still, the rest of the film is really charming, really nice, really laid back. I feel very much captures an age that isn't life or death, but rather just discovery, influence, and making mistakes here and there. It's kind of all those things you want to see in those popular coming-of-age stories that are also kind of corny, but they're done right. It's soothing, it's enjoyable, and it's definitely worth checking out. It's what many consider Hayao Miyazaki's grandest masterpiece, Princess Mononoke. This was one of the first major releases in America of Miyazaki's work. Originally under Miramax and getting one hell of a cast to redub it, Mononoke was the highest grossing film in Japan until Titanic came along. And that's how they marketed it for a while. What is in this film that got so much of the Japanese culture coming back to it? Going in, I was pretty hyped up. And after it was done, I definitely liked it a lot. Maybe not to the level everyone else liked it, but yeah, yeah, alright, let's just jump right in. The prince of a village named Ashitaka tries to stop a demon from attacking it. After his arm gets touched by the demon, he finds out that he's doomed to die because of it. At what pace will it consume him and how much of its strength will it take? That all depends on how much he can tame the part of the demon that's forever going to be inside him. He decides to set out on a quest to, as he puts it, see with eyes unclouded by hate. What he discovers is a war going on between the human world and the world of the forest filled with animals and gods. The humans want to make a prosperous future for themselves, while the animals and the gods of the forest want them to leave. He comes across an industrial leader, voiced by Minnie Driver, who wants to cut off the head of the spirit of the forest so they'll have no more trouble from them. One of the forest's greatest fighters, the queen of the wolves and her half-human, half-wolf daughter, are at the forefront of trying to stop her and regain balance back to nature. All while Ashitaka is caught in the middle, not knowing which side to choose, and not knowing which foe to fight. The movie has a lot going for it, in fact I think you could argue this is probably Miyazaki's most adult work. Not just because of the violence and gore, though there is quite a bit of it, but because its message is not so obvious and blatant. At least, not in terms of movies that have done in the past. What's the route this could so easily go? The Fern Gully, Dances with Wolves, Pocahontas, Avatar bullshit where the humans are evil, nature is good, the end. But one of the great things about this film is that there is no real villain. Even Minnie Driver's character is very likable. She's helping to cure the sick, she's a great motivator, she brings people together. She knows the tragedy of war and she listens to the people who have lost so much. 
There's also other side characters that could so easily just be seen as villains, but they put it very straightforward that there are no real bad guys in this world, there's just people trying to get what they can. Trying to survive, trying to be comfortable, trying to be prosperous. It's a very human as well as animalistic trait. And that's part of what makes it so clever. It's showing that the humans and the animals are very much alike, but not in the same way that, oh, we shouldn't fight them because we're so similar, but in the way that this is the reason why we're fighting, because we are too similar and we both want the same thing. Lots of land and lots of means to survive a very long time. It's funny because when I review Nausicaa, a lot of people were comparing it to this movie. Like which one did it better, which one was stronger, and a lot of people seem to lean towards this one. In a sense, I kind of agree. I think this movie has much better characters. I think its message is a little bit more direct, but it's also a little smarter. It ties in much more to what's happening nowadays and will probably happen in the future where Nausicaa had this really big story that went all over the place and could kind of do it because it was so large in scale, Mononoke feels like a smaller story yet kind of tries to do the same thing. It goes everywhere and back again. We cut back to so many of these same locations like three or four times. And don't get me wrong, I like these locations, but there's only so many times I can see our main character walk back and forth between them. It was definitely a film where before the climax I was kind of looking at my watch saying, huh, how long is this movie? Not that I wasn't enjoying it, but I was definitely noticing the length. And definitely felt it could have been cut at least 10-15 minutes. Just take out a couple more scenes of him running to the other side saying, wait, stop! Also, as much as I love the characters in this, I do think there's one that's surprisingly not very interesting. And believe it or not, it's Mononoke. I don't think she's a very interesting character. And she should be. Half human, half wolf, constantly torn between what she is and who she's supposed to be. This should be great for the main character. They should be able to talk and share stories and be able to relate unbelievably. They're both kind of going through the same thing. But most of her dialogue, voiced by Claire Danes, is mostly just her shouting, no, no, I'm a wolf, no, no, I'm a wolf. Which is so strange because Miyazaki is so good at these kind of characters. The young heroine who's action-packed but doesn't know which route to take. He usually writes them so well, but this one is just so whiny. I have no idea why the film is named after her. It would have been neat if she played as big a part as Ashitaka. It would have been nice if she was just as complex as he was. But as is, she just didn't do anything for me. I know that's so weird because she's like the big icon from the film, but outside of her design, I think she's a real missed opportunity. But thankfully, like I said before, the rest of the characters are very interesting. And their dilemmas are very understandable and relatable. This is about the majesty of the forest and the majesty of mankind, both evolving too fast for their own good and trying to figure out where to level out. I do really like this film, and there's even elements of it I absolutely love. I think if it was just a bit shorter, a little less complicated, and the Mononoke character was made more interesting, it could have been something phenomenal. At least, from my standpoint. I know to a lot of people this is phenomenal, and I can totally see why. The voice acting, the imagination, the writing, it's a strong piece. I guess I just don't quite see it as the masterpiece that everybody else builds it up to be. I do have issues with it that hold me back from absolutely adoring it. But the stuff that's good is just too damn good to overlook. Whether you love it, like it, think it's mediocre, or even don't like it at all, it's a good film to check out because there's just too many interesting things in it. I can't see anybody going to see this film and just saying there was nothing to get out of it. It's an impressive feat and everybody should check it out at some point. I just can't call it the Lawrence of Arabia of animation like everybody else does. But I still think it's a pretty damn good movie. The animation alone is breathtakingly impressive. So, go find a copy, give it a watch, and see what all the animation buffs are talking about. It's no secret that Hollywood has been out of original ideas for a while. Everything is either based on a comic, or a book, or a popular series, or a TV show. Everything is retro and based off of something. And while a lot of good stuff has come from it, it is kind of a shame that we don't really see that much new stuff coming out. But then every once in a while, you get something as friggin awesome as Spirited Away. Hands down, one of my all-time favorite films. 
this movie has the creativity of all the great trippy fairy tales, Alice in Wonderland, Labyrinth, The Nightmare Before Christmas, so much of this really original stuff that you just don't see that much anymore. I almost wonder if years later they're gonna try and do a reboot of this, like a different interpretation. The world is so open, the creature's so strange, it actually would kind of be fun to see an artist's different interpretation of it. Most people say you know something is a masterpiece when you can't duplicate it. In a sense, I kind of disagree. People say books like Peter Pan or Christmas Carol are masterpieces, but we're constantly seeing different versions of it all the time. So many new adaptations come out, and I can see the same thing happen with this. It's a world you're both delighted by and horrified by at the same time. You want to live in it, but you also kind of want to run away from it. In my opinion, that's the making of a great environment. The story's about a little girl and her parents that are moving to a new neighborhood. They come across what they think is an abandoned theme park, but really it's an enchanted bathhouse. When the sun goes down and the lights come on, all sorts of various spirits come from around the world to relax here. This terrifies our main character as she finds out her parents have turned into pigs. And she also lives in a world that absolutely hates humans. But luckily, she befriends a boy, who can thankfully also turn into a dragon, who decides he wants to help her. He introduces her to the old lady who runs the place, and decides that if she wants to stay alive, she'll have to get a job. And the rest of the film is her just trying to survive in this bizarre place, while also trying to make friends out of enemies who can eventually help her get her parents back. The girl in this movie named Zen is very identifiable. She is terrified of everything, but so are we. We don't know what this world is, and it is really creepy. We see weird stuff happen. Like I said, her parents turn into pigs. There's monsters around every corner. She has to sneak around or else they'll kill her. But at the same time, you start to enjoy kind of the goofiness of it too. There are a lot of funny characters with unbelievable designs. This whole movie is like a party house for imagination. Every creature has their own unique look. Some more human, some more spider-like, some more lizard-like. And the majority of them have very distinct and likable personalities. What I kind of like about though is unlike something like Kiki or My Neighbor Totoro, they do put a little bit more of a story to it. There is still a goal that has to be accomplished by the end of the film. She has to escape and save her parents. But it's how she goes through it that's the focus and what's so entertaining. She comes across so many delightful people, both delightful in how charming they are or delightful in how terrible they are. Some are even kind of half and half and it's hard to get a grasp on them. Like most of Miyazaki's great work, there is no one straight up villain. There's just kind of rude people, kind of crazy people, kind of sane people. It's just a wide variety. The voice acting, once again, pitch perfect. That's the same actress who voiced Lilo doing the voice of Zen. Man, what a talent. She gets every emotion you need to feel in every scene. She is frantic, she is whiny, and she is a complainer, but it's never to a point where she's annoying. You totally understand what she's going through. Hell, you would probably do half of this stuff too. There's also so many great side stories going on about discovering people's past, finding out the flaws of these creatures and how they can be helped out. But even in between all of that, there can still be moments of just relaxing and letting the atmosphere sink in. My god, my favorite scene is when they're on the train. Nothing is happening here, they're just traveling and looking out the window. But after all the craziness that's happened, it's just the one place you want to be. There's no dialogue here, there's no talking whatsoever. It's just them looking out the window and you can feel what they're going through. This is the power of a visual medium. Not everything has to be spelled out. A scene can just play and you can take whatever you want from it because you know there's such talented people behind it. Talented people that can make you feel afraid in one scene but delighted in the next. If I really had to nitpick anything, I mean friggin' anything in this movie, it's that the owner of the shop also has a twin sister. They literally look exactly alike, even down to what they wear, and with all this creativity and different people and creations, why didn't you make her look different? She didn't have to be a twin sister. I mean, okay, there's one scene where she kind of fools Zen, but it wasn't necessary. You could have made her more beautiful or more ugly or just do something a little different. But like I said before, that's really scraping the bottom of the barrel in terms of nitpicking. I've said before, this is a movie that's so good, I'm actually kind of jealous of it. I wish I could come up with something this beautiful looking. I wish I could create these incredible locations. I wish I could come up with such funny ideas to get rid of curses and stuff like that. It's kind of like the imagination of a brilliant child, but brought to life by brilliant adults. These incredible animators and phenomenal storytellers that just keep you sucked in through the simple needs of our main characters that anybody can identify with, and can identify with very quickly. Being scared of a new place, trying to figure out your identity, having problems with family, putting up with people you don't like, all these things that are so quick to pick up. 
and it's all done in one of the most incredible environments ever put on screen. I love this movie from beginning to end. It's just unbelievable. The acting, the writing, the storytelling, and above all, the unbelievable imagination. Everyone's praised the hell out of this movie, and I'm one of the critics who's just gonna do the same. But it's just that good. I can't find that many things wrong with it. It's the exact kind of movie I would want to see at any age. One that just engulfs me in its world. I don't even know what else to say about it. It's just amazing. Pop it in your DVD player and experience it for yourself. So remember that story in Whispers of the Heart that the girl was writing about this cat baron who could go into these magical lands and have these great powers? Well, apparently the idea was so good that they decided to make a movie out of it. Insert the Cat Returns, a very confusing title seeing how the cat isn't really returning, he's meeting this character for the first time, but whatever. The character he meets is a girl named Haru. She saves a cat from danger in the middle of the road, but it looks like that cat is a magical cat. The prince of a kingdom, to be exact. A kingdom ruled by talking felines just like him. Touched by his rescue, he asks Haru if she would marry him. She's so dumbfounded by what she's seen, she doesn't know what to say, and he confuses it for a yes. So the king of the cats, played by Tim Curry, demands that she be brought to the kingdom and turned into a cat herself. Her only salvation is a cat baron, played once again by Carrie Elways, who voiced the exact same character in Whispers of the Heart. Through all his magical antics and mysterious ways, he finds a way to get her out of trouble as she gets back into trouble, and they constantly keep saving each other back and forth. And it's a race to get home as all sorts of whimsical magic keeps taking place, much enchanted scenery is discovered, which of course leads to a lot of fun and some fantastic imagery. It's funny that they got Carrie always to play this part because it actually does sort of have a Princess Bride feel to it. Not the story itself, but more kind of the feel. It is kind of funny and quirky but it's also kind of like a fairy tale, with magical lands, flying, talking animals. It's a really charming setup. A young Anne Hathaway plays Haru, and she does a wonderful job. Actually playing it very similar to her Princess Diaries character, which I stand by wouldn't be that bad a character if she was put in a better story. This is that better story. She is klutzy and awkward, but she's also kind of wide-eyed, innocent, and just trying to make sense of a world that has very little of it. The rest of the voice actors are great too. Tim Curry, pfft, how can you go wrong? Not entertaining enough! Yes, sire. Whoever's next better not stink, got it? Peter Boyle as the Baron's sidekick. But there is one casting choice that just boggles the hell out of me. I first saw this in the original Japanese language, and one of my favorite characters was this cute little assistant cat. You just saw her and you just wanted to pinch her cheek. She was so cute and she had this little smile and this friendly little voice. She was just adorable. But then, when the American dub came, who did they get to voice her? Excuse me, but I think there's a bit of a problem. Wait a minute, is that Andy Richter? Why is Andy Richter doing what is so obviously a female design? This isn't like in Kiki with Phil Hartman where maybe it's male, maybe it's female, you can't quite tell by the design. This is so clearly female. Every time I see this character, it's just so jarring to instead not hear this cute little fluffy voice and instead Conan's co-host. Emergency exit for all guests right here, please, thanks. And don't get me wrong, he does fine, it's just, it's so clear this isn't the right voice that should go with this character. It's kind of like giving the voice of the Little Mermaid to a male baritone singer, it just doesn't add up. However, the rest of the film is just a pure delight. It's not anything on an epic scale like, say, Mononoke or Nausicaa. It's more like what the girl was writing in Whispers of the Heart, a cute little fairy tale. But as cute little fairy tales go, it's very well done. It's funny, it's imaginative, it's clever. It has enjoyable characters and a lot of wonderful visuals. But hey, why listen to me talk about it anymore? See for yourself and get whisked away. If you've seen my Nostalgia Critic review of Ponyo, you might remember a very particular ending. It's Miyazaki, it has its own charm, and it's just a lot of fun. <laughs> Not like that movie Howl's Movie Castle. What? Since then, so many people have asked me why do I hate Howl's Moving Castle? And the first clarification is, I don't hate it. I just don't think it's very good. 
And even by that, I kinda mean by Miyazaki standards. It is still visually interesting and has a lot of imagination, and it even has a fair amount of good character. What it doesn't have is focus. This movie is all over the place. And sure, I'm not gonna act like story was always the biggest part of a Miyazaki film, it was much more about environment and characters and so on, but there was still enough of a simplicity to his work that made it really come out as charming. This one just throws so much at you, it's hard to remember even what happened. Howl in the movie is a wizard played by Christian Bale. He comes across a hatter named Sophie, who then comes across a mean lady known as the Witch of the Waste. It appears this witch is in love with Howl, so much so that when Sophie refuses to serve her, she puts a terrible curse on her, transforming her 18-year-old body into that of a 90-year-old woman. Determined to get the curse lifted, she sets out trying to find Howl and comes across, what else, his moving castle. While there, she comes across some colorful characters, a scarecrow known as Turniphead, Howl's apprentice named Markle, and a talking ball of fire voiced by Billy Crystal. She decides to appoint herself the cleaning woman of the castle because she sees it as such a mess. The bad news is it doesn't seem like he can lift the curse. That's not especially on his mind anyway as there's two warring countries, and one of them wants Howl to use his magic to help them win their fight. Howl goes back and forth between agreeing to do it and not, all while Sophie comes across the evil witch, who seems to be losing her power and thus the curse seems to be going away, but only a little, and actually it's kind of inconsistent. Sometimes she's older, sometimes she's younger, I'm sure there's a reason why, but honestly, this film goes all over the place and tries to throw so much at you that I guess it got lost in there for me. As a lot of this movie did, I'm constantly trying to remember what exactly it was I watched and what happened in what order and what they meant and where we were, and it's just always doing something. I try to figure out why this scatterbrain of a movie did so little for me when something like Spirited Away, which you could argue also does a lot of strange stuff and throws a lot at you, did so much. The only thing I can figure is movies like Spirited Away or Kiki or Nausicaa is that they're fueled by very simple desires. Sen just wants to save her parents and leave. Kiki wants to be an accomplished adult. Nausicaa just wants to save her people. Here, I forget what Howl's motivation is, and yeah, I know Sophie wants to get the curse lifted, but even that sort of seems like something that's put on the back burner half the time. With the other films, the ideas were motivating the visuals. Here, it feels like the visuals are motivating the ideas. I remember there's a particularly strange scene where Sophie and the witch are so slowly going up these stairs, and it's uncomfortable, and it's odd, and it's not pleasant to look at. I remember asking myself, why am I even watching this? How is this enjoyable or dramatic or creative? It's just weird and unpleasant. That's not to say there aren't some good moments. The visuals, for example, are great. There's a really nice scene at the end where she time travels for some reason or other. Again, it's really complicated and hard to follow. And it creates almost kind of a dreamlike scene. I don't know, it's hard to explain, but the colors and the atmosphere and the mood, it's the only time it felt like I was genuinely watching a Miyazaki film. At least in terms of what it made me feel. The rest of the movie definitely looks like a Miyazaki film, and even has some thoughts like a Miyazaki film, but I just didn't feel the same magic as other Miyazaki films. Like I said, I don't think it's awful, and even people who ask me why I didn't like the film kind of nod and understand when I explain it. Even the most diehard Miyazaki fans don't usually consider this one of his best works. It's still impressive, and it's animated great. Hell, even the voice acting is still pretty well done. But it's not really one I look forward to watching again when I had to do Disney December. It has nice artwork here and there, but for the most part, it's just kind of confusing and dull. Which is such an odd thing to say with so much bizarre imagery. But if you don't care behind what's motivating it, why should I care to watch it to the end? I don't know, if you enjoy it, I understand. I'm not gonna act like there's nothing to have fun with in this movie. But for me, it's probably the only Miyazaki film where the lack of focus actually got in the way of it being a good product. I know I'm kind of a minority on that, but I'm not gonna lie, I'm not gonna say I like something when I legitimately don't, but I'm not gonna act like it's anything terrible either. I'd much rather watch the worst of Miyazaki than the best of Michael Bay any day. And I don't really see this film as a waste of time, there's still some cool stuff to see. But in terms of getting some really emotional, magical moments, I'd say his other work is more worth checking out. I know a lot of people like it, it's just not for me.
Tales from Earthsea is based on the series of novels that sadly I haven't read, but based on the majority of the film I've seen here, I just may need to. It starts off with a ship of people that look up and see a bunch of dragons wrestling. Okay, a strong start. But this news makes it back to the king of the land saying that dragons never fight, that this is a horrible omen. They talk about how a lot of strange shit has been going on, like how wizards have been losing their power, balance is being thrown all over the place, something bad is coming, something terrible. And just before they start to proceed forward to figure out what to do about it, the king, who seems like a pretty cool nice character, is killed! I thought this guy was going to be the main character, he seems so nice and strong-willed. But no, the kid that stabbed him is the main character, and on top of that, he's the son of this guy! He steals the sword, runs away from the palace, and the opening credits roll. Holy shit, that's the way to start a story! A million questions were racing through my mind. How is this the main character? What possessed him to kill his father? His father seemed pretty cool. Why are dragons fighting? Why is it bad that they fight? Isn't that what dragons do? What place do they have in this environment? Why is the sun suddenly normal now? He seems afraid of these wolves and like really creeped out. Wasn't this the psycho that just killed his dad a moment ago? Just, oh my god, it's just racing through my head. Everyone thinks you have to start off these epic fantasies with these big battles or explosions or something. But in reality, all the great fantasies start off as little stories. They do this so you can connect with the main character, who's usually somebody who's kind of timid, kind of afraid, but about to go on this big adventure. And that's exactly what this movie does. We get to know our main character, who is the prince, who's on the run from his heinous crime and comes across a wizard, played by Timothy Dalton. I'm convinced this guy is Liam Neeson's monotone if it was made more interesting. Just based on his performance, I would follow this guy anywhere. He's stern and strict, but he definitely sounds like he knows what he's talking about. It doesn't sound like a guy who's trying to sound badass, he sounds legitimately badass. Along their way, they come across a girl with a burn mark on her face. She seems beyond socially awkward, and naturally the prince and her don't get along. But it also turns out she's been adopted by this woman who's a friend of the wizard. Or mage, is there a difference? I don't know, I guess I'll call him mage. Slowly but surely, they start to open up, and of course, they find out they have a lot in common and start a nice relationship together. But troubles are brewing when another evil mage named Cobb, played by Willem Dafoe, is one of the few wizards who hasn't lost his magic. Thus, he plans to use the imbalance that's going on in the world to somehow achieve eternal life. And the mage seems to be the ticket how. Along the way, we discover secrets, magical powers, and the truth about what people's spirits, as well as their physical bodies, are capable of. For the first two thirds of this movie, I was absolutely in love. Everyone always said this film was just okay, but I didn't know what they were talking about. I was sucked in. I was sucked in because I knew this was a smaller story that was taking place in a grander battle. They kept talking about how something big was coming, some sort of big change, and there's just this feeling of dread throughout the whole thing. It's kind of like in Game of Thrones, how when you get down to it, there really aren't that many big battles in it. But it's all about the build-up and establishing the character. While there's not quite as much talk of strategy in this, there certainly is a feeling of a lot of impending doom. Cobb, for example, is one of the creepiest villains. Willem Dafoe throughout almost the entire performance does nothing but whisper his lines, and it is just unsettling! His voice is like a spider crawling its way into your ear, it's just so uncomfortable whenever he speaks. He's so hard to figure out too, I mean, you know he's a bad guy, but he always has this confident smile on his face. You know he can do these terrible big things, but he's also very frail and moves very little. You have no idea what this guy is up to, but you know he has everything figured out. And that's one of the creepiest things about a villain. One that just has no fear whatsoever. So like I said, watching this film, I was just engrossed. Where was this all going? What's it building up to? What's the bigger, grander picture that they're finally gonna deliver? But then, when we get to the third act, I was really disappointed. Instead of a big battle, or getting a bunch of Vancers, or getting an army together, or just something that seems larger, it's just a small fight in a castle with the hero wielding his sword, a few magic spells thrown, and just fighting a great big monster while trying to save the damsel in distress. Oh man, what a letdown! For a film that opens up with dragons wrestling and so much dread and people saying there's this great imbalance and something terrible is coming, this is that terribleness that was coming? I totally accept the possibility that maybe this is just the first part of the story. Like maybe this is the Fellowship of the Ring part and there's going to be more to it. But even in Fellowship, they knew how to make a bigger deal of their climax. How to make you feel that this is important stuff you're watching. Ironically, the problem I always had with Fellowship is that you never felt the simpler side of it. The normal quiet life of our main character that's going to be interrupted. Everything in Fellowship was big and huge, even the party they threw. This movie has the exact opposite problem. The simpler stuff is there and is very well done. And it has some phenomenal build-up for what they could possibly deliver. 
but in this movie, it never is delivered. Even the ending kind of looks like they're done and wrapping up. Speaking of which, I don't understand the ending at all. Without giving away too much detail, there's another interaction with a dragon, kinda, sorta, and I just don't get it. It didn't seem like something that was meant to be abstract or open to interpretation. It seemed to be like, yeah, you're supposed to know what this is. You're supposed to know what's going on and why it's going on. The film is directed not by Hayao Miyazaki, but by his son, Goro. And for a first film, it's really impressive. Like I said, I love the first two-thirds of this movie. I don't think I've ever been so hyped to see where a fantasy film was going. I really thought this was going to be like a Narnia, something that starts off so simple and basic but turns into this grand epic battle. Instead, it feels more like the last level in a Zelda game. Even Willem Dafoe seems to go from that terrifying voice to something that seemed more Green Goblin-ish. But still, does that mean I should dislike the entire movie for that? I don't think so. I still love the majority of this film. If they ever did make a sequel to it, I'd probably watch it, in the hopes that it actually does go somewhere bigger. Like I said, I haven't read the books, and I have no idea how close it is or far it is to it. But for what it is, I really enjoyed the journey. I just didn't enjoy where it ended up. I'll emphasize right now, though, that I'm one of those people that just likes these kind of stories, the stories that start off small and get bigger and bigger and bigger. For example, I'm one of the few people that actually like the first Hobbit. I kind of felt like it was the Fellowship of the Ring I never got. So I don't think this is a fantasy that's going to engulf everybody. Hell, most people say it's okay at best. But personally, I could get lost in this world and its environment and watch these characters all day. Yeah, I know this review is kind of all over the place, but hopefully you can get an idea if this is something you'd be interested in. Take your chances and see what you discover. It's almost kind of pointless to talk about Ponyo, seeing how I've done a whole entire Nostalgia Critic review dedicated to it. But let's take a quick look anyway, because this time we won't have any jokes or anything. Just a straightforward, honest opinion. The film is very loosely based on The Little Mermaid, and when I say very loosely, I mean there's practically no reason to connect it to The Little Mermaid. It's a female half-human, half-fish that comes out of the water, befriends a male, and that's about it. Everything else is completely 100% different. It has less to do with The Little Mermaid than... Well, the Little Mermaid. Ponyo is an enchanted fish who comes from a magical man named Fujimoto, played by Liam Neeson. One day she decides to go exploring and comes across a boy playing in the sea. As she becomes more and more human, the boy and her start to form a very strong relationship. The longer she stays human and out of the sea, the more it seems to throw the world out of whack. And I mean really out of whack. Towns are suddenly put under water, the moon is about to crash into the earth, it suddenly gets totally insane. But you almost wouldn't notice it, seeing how totally calm and relaxed everybody seems to be. Yeah, those other houses are underwater. Big deal. You know what? It's a good day for a picnic. Let's row our boats, go fishing, just totally have fun on this otherwise beautiful day. Yeah, it's that kind of movie. Can Ponyo get back in time in order to set everything right? Well, again, being that kind of movie, you can probably guess what the outcome's gonna be. Weird. And that's definitely a word to describe this movie. Weird. It's still charming and really likable, but it is weird. The funny thing about it is that even though there is a lot of surreal imagery, that's not what's so strange about it. The strangeness really does just lie in the story. You couldn't predict the reactions or the choices that these characters make, or the outcomes that they produce. On the one hand, it's just so strange to get a grasp on. I mean, it seems like this is a tiny little story about a girl befriending a boy and all sorts of little magic. But then he hear talks about the moon is gonna destroy the world and it's like, where did this come from? But on the other hand, that's also what's kind of charmingly strange about it. It's basically in its own strange setup where even if the world seems to be underwater, it's kind of okay. Something about that optimism is very bizarrely likable. Unexplainable, to say the least, but still likable. And I think a lot of that just comes from its simplicity. All this chaos is constantly going around these characters, and yet the biggest concern for our main lead is to get Ham. Yeah, she discovers what Ham is and is totally obsessed with it. How can you not like a film so weird? Even the art style seems a lot simpler compared to other Miyazaki movies. But I don't mean that in any way to insult it, I think that's just the style. It's drawn much more like a kid's book, and it's kind of told in that way too. Well, 
for the most part. Again, the complications of the plot are really... I don't know, I don't want to say lazy, but not really needed. But then again, maybe that's the point of it. Maybe it is meant to just exist in this world where this extreme simplicity and this extreme complicated batshit insane plot can exist together and just sort of create its own weird setup. I don't know if that necessarily makes a classic, but it definitely makes an interesting experience. And at the heart of it is still some likable characters, some enjoyable animation, and a whole lot of charm. I really like watching this kid and just how ambitious and excited she is. The tiniest things just get her going nuts, and yeah, her happiness is kind of contagious. So does the film make a lot of sense? No. But is it meant to? Probably not. The two words I constantly hear from people in describing it is weird, but cute. And I think that's sort of the reaction I get out of it too. It's crazy, but it's adorable. It's all over the place, but it's a lot of fun too. I definitely wouldn't put it up there with Kiki or Spirited Away, but it's definitely a movie that's likable enough to put on a few times. Take a look and experience the madness for yourself. The secret world of Arietti seems very much returning to the form that films like Kiki and Totoro did. Except in this case, they take the idea of a very small story and literally make it a very small story. Based on the book The Borrowers, we follow the world of very tiny people that live in a little house and how they manage to get around without ever being seen. But our main character, Arietti, does get seen once, coming across a boy who apparently seems to be very slowly dying. He seems to have come to peace with it, and talks about his life with her. Over time, they find they have a lot in common, share a lot of their experiences, and form a very strong friendship. But things start to get a little crazy when one of the other people in the house starts to think there are little people that are roaming through the wood, and dedicates all of her time and effort to finding out where. Once again, that's about all there is to the story, but once again, that's about all that you need. The characters are all very likable and all very intelligent. I really like hearing the conversations that they share with one another. You really feel a sense of family in this film. A lot of films I see that focus on family have a lot of jokes and one-liners and put-downs and stuff, kind of like a sitcom. Here, everyone seems to talk like a real person. The only one who seems to speak differently is the boy with the terminal illness, but that's a boy with a terminal illness. And it's really fascinating to get inside his mindset to hear how he sees the world and how he feels so very small in it. Which of course is very fitting, telling this to a very small person. They both have big worlds with big limitations and yet for entirely different reasons. But even for all their talking, there's still a lot of visual imagination to this movie. Even just them trying to get across the kitchen is like this really big event. There's a great scene where they have to do it at night and they have to be quiet. It's almost like watching an episode of Mission Impossible. It's just so suspenseful. And it's also great to see just how they get through this world. All the little secret passages, all the devices that they make. The engineering, even on such a small scale, is very impressive. The only downside I have, which I'm starting to accept more and more as just sort of a criticism of Japanese cinema, I think, is that the ending, once again, seems a little rushed. At least, in the placement of the credits. The movie seems to be building up to a proper epilogue, and then they just start showing the names of everybody that's in it. Doesn't that usually mean it's time to get up and time to walk away? I can't really focus on what they're showing me if I'm reading the people that worked on the film. And I really would have liked to have been totally engrossed in that and just watched that without a bunch of names flashing in front of me. I don't get the creative choice, but I can definitely say it happens in a lot of anime and films from Japan. Maybe it's a creative style I don't get, but it does kind of bother me. But it in no way ruins the film. This is a really charming, likable piece. It's not any huge epic, but at the same time, you do really get sucked into a lot of their problems. You do kind of take a little bit of a gasp whenever they're about to be seen. You do kind of become fearful that they might get caught. But at the same time, you enjoy the simpler moments of them just sitting back and having a conversation about the greater things as well as the smaller things. I really liked it, and I definitely enjoyed its very laid-back structure. If you're looking for big adventure, you'll get elements of it here and there, but it's mostly a very calm, subdued family film. But hey, what the hell's wrong with that? Give it a shot and see for yourself. He says I should really hate from up on Poppy Hill. Like, really hate it. This is a phenomenally cliched story. 
A high school girl comes across a high school boy who, big shock, don't get along. But the more they hang out, the more they realize maybe they can get along, and start to form a romantic connection. But once she shows that her father has died in the war and he sees the picture, guess what? By huge coincidence, it looks like her father was also his father, and they may be brother and sister. Even he himself says it's kind of like a bad melodrama. Frustrated by this, they try to figure out what they're supposed to do while interacting with all sorts of goofy characters and learning life lessons and interacting with adults who are sometimes right, sometimes wrong, while constantly hearing that goofy music that just celebrates a time of being young. Yeah, it sounds pretty standard and done a million times, and in many respects, it kind of is. I was kind of rolling my eyes that these are the turns that this story is taking, but at the same time, I did find myself kind of wrapped up in it. I think a lot of that comes from not only the pacing and the animation style, which is beautiful to look at, but also some really damn good voice acting. I mean, the voice acting in the American dubs of the Ghibli films have usually been spectacular and Disney's done a wonderful job. But this one especially seems good because, unlike the other Ghibli films, there's not a lot of supernatural elements or magical scenes or weird angles or anything like that. It's just sort of straightforward what you see is what you get. Therefore, the performances have to be good or it's gonna lose you very quickly. I'm really amazed at not only how well they match the lip movements, but how they keep the emotion of the characters totally intact while doing so. Everybody has a slip up here or there, even the best actors. But this one seems really on track and seems to hit everything pitch perfect. Another strong point is its side stories, which again are a little cliched, but so much time is dedicated to them, I do find myself actually getting pretty wrapped up in them. For example, there's a building that holds a bunch of school clubs that's going to be torn down. All the students inside, most of them boys, are pissed off and constantly fighting to keep it around. However, with the help of our main character and her friends, they show that a big part is the appearance, and that if they clean it up, get it looking nice, and stop being awkward social shut-ins, maybe they'll have a better chance to save it. At first I was kind of annoyed at what cutouts a lot of these boys seemed like, just the traditional nerds that said traditional nerdy things. But after a while, I really didn't want to see that place go. I really found myself liking it. I even grew accustomed to some of these oddballs, even if they were kind of cliched. So on the one hand, yeah, it is kind of a story that's been done a million times. The coming of age story that's in the 60s and kind of American graffiti-ish meets Animal House-ish meets, I don't know, just a million other movies you've seen before. But I think with a visual touch, some really good acting, and some really decent pacing and atmosphere, it actually comes out okay. Can you feel the manipulation when it's going on? Absolutely. But you can also kind of feel the charm of it too, slowly over time. I do still see a lot of major problems with it, especially with the music that seems constantly on all the time. But even that starts to die down after a while, and you start to hear these people for what they're really saying. And maybe you start to see the movie for what it's really doing. Be a charming little film that may have been done a million times before, but maybe isn't trying to do anything that new. Just try to do it in a way that's standard, but charming. At least, charming enough. I'd say you probably have to be pretty forgiving in order to really get into this film, but if you lower down your defenses a little bit, it isn't half bad. Not a great experience, but not a harsh one either. If you're looking for a romance that's standard, but pleasant, this isn't a bad one to check out. Let's finish off Disney December with The Wind Rises, Miyazaki's final film. Which, yeah, he said that a couple times before, but hey, who am I to complain if he wants to make more movies? They're always great! As far as I know, this is the first time he's actually taken on a true story. The film centers around the life of a designer who created the Japanese World War II fighting planes. Many, many people would see this as a bad person, but the film makes it very clear that all he wants to do is be innovative and push the boundaries of what can be done with technology. It's shown very clearly that even from his youth, all he's ever wanted to do was push the envelope. And the film, rather than focus on the controversies of what it led to, though don't get me wrong, it's not entirely ignored either, focuses instead on the innovation and the imagination to bring these incredible wonders to life. In some respects, it's the most downplayed out of the Miyazaki films. I mean, there's not really any monsters or moving castles or anything like that. But he still finds a way to incorporate so much beauty and so much artistry into it. 
For example, he constantly gets visits in his dreams from his heroes, great inventors and creators who are constantly encouraging him to try and find a way to make himself even better. He also comes across a lot of places that happen to look beautiful, and even survives an earthquake that, as you imagine being a Miyazaki film, is pretty incredible to watch. Again, one of the charms of Miyazaki is that you can be technically not watching much, just a guy working on a plane or talking about ideas or working with other people, but there's such a likable ambition and atmosphere and environment to all of it. You want to get to know these people, you want to help them with their planes. And knowing Miyazaki's love for gears and gadgets, this film has all sorts of that. Creating, building, failing, trying again. And you really admire this guy for having a dream, trying his damnedest to follow it all the way through, even if in the end it would amount to something horrible. As I said before, the film doesn't ignore the fact that this resulted in the deaths of so many people. There's definitely people dropping hints about the Nazi party and what he's getting involved in, and all the way through it, he doesn't know what to do, he just wants to create, he wants to be the inventor. I suppose a lot of people could look at him as a bad person for this, but it's also kind of like Einstein. Here's a guy who created the atomic bomb, one of the greatest destroyers of human life, yet we still see him as a genius. And there's definitely people that don't like him too because of that. But there's no denying that there's still a brilliant mind at work that used a lot of creativity, imagination, and determination to do what they thought was going to be a great thing. And I think that's the best thing to admire about this film. The ambition. The ambition of the main character, the ambition of him trying to get his ideas done and trying to do what he loves to do. There's a wonderful final image where he's discussing with one of his masters what he's done and what he's created. It's a beautiful yet haunting landscape of a bunch of people dead and planes destroyed, yet it's in this beautiful green field of imagination and possibility. It's such a weird mix. But it's also the perfect bittersweet sum up to everything this guy was working for. The problems I have with the film are very minor. For example, the romance in the film, though I don't know the real story about it, seems a touch forced. He meets this woman by accident during an earthquake, and then years later they happen to stumble across each other again, and even without knowing each other very well, they decide to suddenly get married. It's almost something like out of a 40s Disney fairy tale. Again, I don't know if that was intentional or if it was a cultural thing, but it was definitely a little odd. It's not that they have no chemistry, but for a film we know is supposed to be based on real life, it's a touch distracting. I also start to notice things that I guess I never really picked up from Miyazaki before that are also a little weird. Like he never really does sweating or crying correctly, it always kind of looks like they have some sort of sickness. Plus, I know this guy is trying to be helpful and everything, but he scares the shit out of me. Something about those eyes, they just don't look right, it looks like some sort of weird demon, I don't know, couldn't they have fixed that up or something? But aside from that, this film is very obviously a romanticized version of true life events. Yeah, a lot of it technically happened, but it's pretty clear there was a lot of creative liberties. But never to a point where it's insulting. It's kind of like Tombstone, they got the basic story and people down. But yeah, they obviously changed stuff up to make it flow a little nicer and be a little bit more epic, and you can usually tell when those moments are. I think what impressed me most though is only in the last 10 minutes was I starting to get a little tired and saying to myself, oh, I wonder how long this movie is, but then when I checked out and saw it was 126 minutes, I couldn't believe it. Only in the last few did I realize how long it was and through the rest of it I was just enjoying it so much. I can't believe a biography about a guy making planes had me so invested and so drawn in that I was actually willing to sit there for 126 minutes without even realizing I was sitting there for that long. If this did turn out to be Miyazaki's last film, it would definitely be a good one to go out on. It's very clear he has this incredible respect for someone that just wants to follow his dreams and do something incredible. Failing time after time, but still getting right back up to try again. Much like Miyazaki, it's a guy who loves his work and loves doing beyond what he thought he was capable of. Definitely might push some people's sensibilities the wrong way, but I think the focus of the film was to look at the power of imagination, and perseverance and hard work, and dedicating yourself to never giving up and doing something incredible. And I can say that's definitely what I've gotten out of the Studio Ghibli films. A world of imagination, entertainment, and so much hard work that went into it. So many of these films are classics in a lot of people's eyes, and they deserve to be classics in even more people's eyes. People this dedicated, hardworking, and are able to get their ideas to the big screen should be celebrated as much as possible. So thank you so much for joining me in this disney December. Like I said before, there are a couple popular demands I'll throw in in January. But for the most part, I want to say thanks to you guys for always making this such a fun experience to put these together, share my opinions, share yours as well, and keep talking about great artwork that comes from great people. 
Keep alive those great ideas, determination, artistry, and always allow great imagination to take flight. By popular demand, The Tale of Princess Kaguya. Based on the famous Japanese folktale that sadly I don't really know, so I'm not gonna be able to compare it that much. What I do know though is that this is a film that has a totally distinct artistic style that is all its own. It has this incredible simplicity to its technique, which can often work in its favor and other times possibly be a little stale. Which is fitting because the film itself kinda has that feel to it. But before you kill me, let's go ahead and actually look at the story. A man cutting bamboo in the forest suddenly comes across a baby inside one of the trees. At first, she looks like royalty, but then she suddenly becomes a real little kid. He takes her home to his wife, and he's totally convinced that this is a princess. Or at least, that she's supposed to grow up into a princess. Why else would she look like royalty when she was born? Convinced that her status is going to mean everything, the father does everything he can to try and buy her all the things he thinks she deserves. The mother is not as concerned about her status as much as she just grows up happy. One minute she's a baby, the next day she's a little girl, the next possibly a teenager. They're not sure why this is, but they try everything in their power to not only love her, but also try to get a royal position. Which, I'll admit, is a little confusing in this world. They sort of get her etiquette lessons and get this really nice place to live in, but her parents aren't king or queen, so why would she be a princess? Either way, that doesn't seem to stop them as they go around parading to everybody that she is in fact a princess. Soon she starts getting all this attention and all these suitors start coming in, but as par for the course, she doesn't really like being a princess, doesn't really like the suitors, and is constantly getting into trouble. As time goes on, she does discover her real origin, and if I say any more, it would kind of give things away. Let's just say, it's definitely more supernatural stuff. The best parts of the film are the beginning and the ending. The beginning for the tight family connection and how lovable they are working off each other, and the ending for its dreamlike imagery as well as tone with sort of a bittersweet send-off. I dare say it's almost a little too strange in how rushed it is, but it still leaves an interesting feeling. The middle is where it's the toughest to get through. One, we've seen all these cliches before, the princess who doesn't want to be a princess so she's going to fight back and be rebellious and all the people are going to tell her to be this other thing and yeah, 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 seen it, seen it, not too much that's new. But on top of that, it is just so slow moving. There are so many moments that drag on and on. I remember thinking to myself, this should be over in a few minutes. Why are we focusing 10 to 20 minutes on some of these subplots? For example, she gives a challenge to each of these three suitors that try to win her hand. They're all impossible challenges, but nevertheless, all the suitors try and accommodate anyway. This should only take up like 5-10 minutes of the film's time, but I think it goes on for something like 20 or 25. I guess I just didn't understand why these scenes were so important. I mean, I love atmosphere. You see me praise movies like Kiki that have very little going on, but they're just so likable and they have such a world to explore that, yeah, I absolutely love it. With this one though, maybe because the style is so simple, you don't really feel like you can get sucked in as much. At least not enough if you're going to work with a very loose story. The style itself, I'm gonna be very honest, I was kind of expecting a little bit more with. For example, there's a scene where she really gets her feelings hurt and she runs out of the palace and all of a sudden everything goes really sketchy and it just looks unbelievable. This is inspired an animation style that actually works around the emotions of the character. Holy smokes, this is ingenious! Maybe the more confident she feels, the more together and straight the lines will be, or the more she's falling apart, the more the animation will look more rugged and sketchy and... Yeah, holy smokes, this is almost like a totally new way to do animation. It could actually revolutionize some things. But that scene where she runs out is literally only one scene, and it's at the most a minute long. Why couldn't they do that throughout the majority of the film? I mean, I know it probably would cost a little bit more money, but it's already so simple anyway, why not go all the way with it? But for the most part, it just sort of stays in this one style, and that's it. What a shame, what a missed opportunity. So did I dislike the film? I don't know if I can say that. I mean, it was still so engaging to watch, and yeah, it was slow moving, but I still want to know where it was going. There are still a lot of scenes that have a lot of imagination and sort of play with tone a little bit, almost like something out of a dream but I don't know if I can get behind it like a lot of other Studio Ghibli's works. I think I saw more possibility that was tapped upon than fully explored. 
Which isn't totally bad, I mean, I'm glad something new was done here, I just wish it could have gone all the way with it. So again, kind of a mixed review, but I would still lean towards that is worth checking out, because, hey, it is still great artistry. And it is still a story that I want to know by the end what was going to happen. Take that for what you will and decide for yourself.